how you have been warned. Hey. Okay, um, I'll make a little introduction. So you can see up by unsub, well, I'm gonna, no, I won't change your name. I, unsub records. You can change my name <laughs> so people know my name. I will, I will. That's not my name. Okay, so this is Matias Mora. He is one of my best friends. He was in my wedding, even. That's how close of friends we are. Um, he and I uh, went to college together. We went to the University of Southern California and we were both in the same music program. So we were uh, really kind of joined at the hip from the start and uh, we lived together for several years. We made a lot of music together. Um, my band has played with his band. Like my band is open for his band. His band is open for my band. Like we've just, uh, we've done a whole bunch of stuff together. And he is uh, one of the most talented songwriters I know. He is uh, an excellent engineer and uh, he's a super creative producer. He's really skilled at the computer. I would say the computer is his instrument at this point. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, he's an amazing vocalist. Um, he can kind of do it all. And I missed him a lot this quarantine. Um, but we'll hang out next week. Uh, he lives in Los Angeles. We don't live too far from each other. And um, I wanted him to, I've asked him a few times in the past to come and be a part of this camp. And this is the first time it's worked out. So I'm really stoked to have him here. Uh, uh, he has some songs that he's produced and written that he's going to share with you. And I encourage all of you to ask uh, any questions you have about anything he's doing, because he is a, f uh, a well of information. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll turn it over to you, Matthias. Cool. Um, well, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I'm all those things that Eric said. Um, and I kind of just wanted to get started, maybe just like playing some music. Um, and then I think it'd be cool to like play it, kind of explain, I'll explain what this is. I'll play it. And then any questions that you guys have, we can have, or we can talk about. And then, um, yeah, I have some, there's some cool thoughts I have about this particular production. Um, so this is, um, uh, a track I did with my friend Sin. And um, it's probably her biggest song. And we were asked to um, reproduce a lot of her songs from an EP that I did um, as part of like a, a reimagined kind of stripped acoustic versions. Um, so this one was a kind of a challenging song to do because the original recording is actually just electric guitar vocals and like a little bit of strings. So when they asked me to like strip this down, I was like, OK, <laughs> um, what do I do take out? the guitar and I and and I, that was actually totally the solution so guitar and vocals down to just vocals basically um there's a little synth bass in there but uh yeah I'll play this for you guys um so there's a link so if everyone wants to hear this um there's a link in the chat that I put um and it'll just open up like a player on your browser and then you can hear um my session and then I'm gonna share my screen also from Ableton let me do that real quick. Okay. Oh, I'm, and this this production is only 18 tracks, which to me is always, um, I'm always happy when I can get it down with with less less. Stuff. What What would you say the average amount of tracks you use? Is? Um. I mean, if I, like this is really small. Like I, I've done stuff with like this range, but I mean sometimes it can be like 50. That's like max. I, I really. I really try to not use too much stuff. I think things sound yeah. bigger um, when you do that. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to share my screen. Okay. Um, just so everyone knows, tracks, um, that's like each individual instrument in a DAW. So okay. 18 tracks, 18 individual sounds that he's using at any given time. Um, and you guys can see this, right? Yep, yep. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. I'll just play uh, the song. Great.
Okay, that's it. Could everyone hear that? It was kind of quiet on my end. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, I'm going to switch one little thing so I can hear this track. Beautiful. Because I had it on a weird setting for myself. Okay, cool. I'm going to switch to headphones here. Uh, if, by the way, that's really beautiful, Matthias. Um, um, if if you have headphones with you, I would recommend you uh, plug them in. There we go. It'll be easier if I can to walk you guys through the track if I can hear it. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, that's so the original is literally just it's just an electric guitar and vocal basically with the little strings. So, like, I think the first thing that that I did to this was have um, my sister and my friend sing some harmonies to it that I ended up kind of just like taking little pieces of and creating a whole thing. So I'm, I'll, I'll kind of just show you what, what this starts with. Um, so when we wrote the song, there's a line about a train in there too. So just to get some atmosphere, I kind of thought it would be fun to just like kind of put those moving sounds. So the, it's, it just starts with this uh, sound effect here. And it kind of just, it, the timing of it literally just worked out perfectly. So um, I think what we started was, it was this lead, I had this lead. I think we had this. Yeah, that was it. So, so what those originally sounded like, I'll show you here. Um, I'm gonna take off all the plugins. <laughs> all right, this present. Oh, I don't have <laughs> I don't have the original here, <laughs> but it was uh, it was just a, a regular vocal that like I ended up pitching down into these. I'm gonna take out the lead. Just kind of like these choir tones, really long, like chordal stuff to replace the guitar. Um, and I think I think one of my favorite textures too that I got is this little loop that I created um, that kind of just goes through the whole song. So it's, it's really just like, how do I fill space with vocals if I don't have any instruments? Um, and this one, you can, I'll, I'll show you how I created it. So that's actually just her lead. Um, and I. That's what that original file sounded like. And and basically what I was doing, I, I like to like um, kind of create the the marble like block before I before I carve out the statue sometimes. So kind of just finding like really interesting source material. Um, so this was me just, I put auto-tune on her voice, and then I started playing around with, uh, with, this is why I like Ableton too. Oh, not that one. Here, I'll show you this. So for example, so that's that. I'm going to put on auto-tune on this just so you can hear it. Kind of recreate this little effect here. Um, I love. I'm a big fan of autotune. I think that um, sometimes it gets a bad rap because people say that um, it's just used for like pitch correction. But I think it's a really, really interesting tool um, in that it kind of makes anything musical. So I think pushing really extreme sounds into autotune and then it just kind of snaps it into into notes gives you really, really cool source material. Um, so this song's in D major, pretty sure. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm, I just want to hard tune it. I'll show you this little loop. Right. So that's super hard tune. So what I, what I started doing at that point was just to start playing with the pitch. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Actually, I think it was like this.
so what I'm doing there is, and, and this is so cool by Ableton, you can map anything to anything. So I'm gonna map the pitch knob there to a little knob I have right here. Um, So do you see how I'm like creating new melodic material? Just by extending the phrase in, in time, and then it highlights different parts of the melody. And then I ended up just, cre like I put a little reverb on it and I ended up finding this loop that I thought was, was really just kind of beautiful. This, this one. It's, and it's kind of the thread that goes through this whole arrangement. Um, here we go. Just to show you what that sounded like. It's this guy. And that's how I created that sound. Um, so still just vocals. And then. Did you, per so did you perform that thing that we're hearing mm -hmm, then? Mm -hmm. I just, I, I just moved my finger like this. And then I, I'm kind of always recording. Um, and I think the the biggest thing with making music on computers is to be discerning because there's so, 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 so many options mm -hmm. um, that you can really get like overwhelmed with like play. So I think being decisive in, in like a modern world where there's infinite choices is really, really, really important. Um, and I kind of treat it to like, like clothes, like, like I don't buy a shirt if I like it. I buy something if I love it. So my closet isn't mm -hmm. full with like a million things. Um, mm -hmm. So I think also for for like people who write, it's really really important to develop what your taste is and and the difference between I like this and I love this. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you're just kind of creating source material like that, you're like I love that. I love that. I love that. The best of the best of the best. And then um, you have like these little ideas that's that's you've already curated. Um, uh, and then and then you just kind of start to piece it together with this one with with um, <clears throat> piece it together through an arrangement really. Yeah, so you so when you say you're making source material, you are is this this is a like what you're talking about how you like to create the marble before you start chipping mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. So so you you don't even necessarily know what the arrangement is going to sound like mm -hmm. at the end. You're just making something and you're just like, I really like how this thing sounds. Exactly. It's going to turn into something cool no matter what, just because it is cool. Exactly. And and I think okay. it's a bit, it's a, it's like um, playing with randomization, you know, like sometimes when you just make mistakes and play, not compose, um, uh, you end up with accidents and accidents are totally the idea that you never had. Like wow, it's it's yeah. genius. It's like I like they're they're always just these little nuggets from your subconscious that you're like what, um, and I find those to be like the really special ones. Um, but but then having an ear, always having an ear for like I I love this or I don't I don't like this, and and if we get overwhelmed, taking a break. <laughs> That's really. really <laughs> cool. um, so yeah, I we this was all just improvisation. It was just my sister and my friend. One of these is my friend. She's just improvising on that. This is my sister. I just pitched her way down. And then taking these pieces and 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 yeah, creating chords and creating arrangements out of it. So later one on this one, this is still just vocals. It's four vocals. See, and then you can hear I used right there as a little transition or a fill, like the the other part of that that sound right here. And it creates like a really cool um, lift into the, the next section. Is there a question? Yeah, so wait, all of like the back, like the instruments are not instruments, they're vocals? Everything's a vocal. That's so cool. That's yeah. That's yeah. That's really cool. I think it's fun to to use um uh non synth sounds 
a sense. I mean, like, oh, you all, I'm like a filter and like an oscillator. Like, like Skrillex says that the coolest um, oscillator is the human voice. And I totally agree with that. I think he's really smart. Um, so then here's another like uh, trick that I, I love to do. So when I'm, I'm trying to create stretch the least into the most. So I love playing with things in octaves. Um, and so I took this little sampled vocal sound right here. And then just, just, just to let the chorus lift in both directions, that goes up an octave. And then suddenly it's this really shimmery top layer to the chorus. And it's the chorus, so we get a little sub bass in there. That's, that's bas basically, it takes the arrangement and we just stretch it this way. Um, down, deeper and higher with these two layers. That's almost the whole, I don't need to add anything else to that. I could put like a trap beat on that and that'd be so cool. <laughs> so just that and the harmonies. Just sub bass and vocal, nothing else. And then one of the vocals. So I think that's another really cool tool in developing that I love to use, which is just delete things. Like second verse, same thing, just take something out. Um, I think that a lot of times I get scared about like doing things the right or wrong way. And I've learned a lot from people who produce but don't didn't go to school. Um, if something bugs their ear, they just delete it. It's so simple. It's such a simple solution that creates so much space to just take something out. Um, and it's a cool tool in development too, because you haven't heard it contextualized that way. Um, so, so yeah, second verse is the same thing, just with less. And then I introduce things one at a time to like kind of let let our ear develop. So, so just the pieces from the first verse, just one at a time. Now all together. That transition again. So this pre-chorus gets another little melodic phrase on top. So we always get one new thing every section. So that's kind of how that works. So I think that all of these ideas kind of bring in something that I think is really cool to talk about, especially for composers. Um, Cause I think that pop producing is, is really, really compositional. Um, which is, I think that we're in a place now where our speakers let us create information that is, is past what is on the staff. Um, we listen to music with subwoofers. We have tools that let us create um, really clean arrangements in, in, in headphones. Um, and there's a special quality to that because when we're in a big room, right, if we play a short thing on a low instrument, it's gonna bounce around in the room and, and be longer than it actually is and, and all kinds of things. So when we're composing on the computer, we actually have a lot more frequency real estate to occupy, which means that suddenly we can start painting and getting colorful in really extreme ranges of the frequency spectrum. And um, it means that, I mean, I, I always think that the notes on, on staff really matter, but it means that we can develop interest in other ways. Like, I, I think that sometimes pop music nowadays gets a bad rap because it's just four chords over and over. But I think if you start listening to the extreme ranges, what's actually happening in the subs, what's actually happening in, happening in the upper frequencies, we're finding really new compositional techniques that are timbral. And I, I, I think like, or timbral, I'm not sure what the word is. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that that's a really important place to explore because um, there, it's, it's, I think it's really brand new. I don't think we were able to com compose like below like 40 Hertz before. And, um, and it's just, it's just new colors that, that allow us to be maybe simpler with our like source material in harmony and melody, but really, really creative and musical when it comes to like, like I'm doing here, like the development of, uh, of sound music is, I think it's just sound. So, um, 
you can uh, and another another note to that too is that if I drive an EQ hard enough, I'm actually changing the harmonic structure of a note. So I am composing by just using an equalizer. Um, and I think that's a, that's a I think sometimes uh, music creation gets people have funny rules about it. Um, and I think that there's a lot more that we can do to affect music than just the notes on the page. And I think that's why Eric says that the computer is my instrument. Um, so basically, just to like show you guys this and, and really to encourage you to like really listen um, without analyzing. Because I think when we analyze, we're thinking about the notes on the staff. And I think when we listen, we can hear all those micro discrepancies up in the upper frequencies and the lower parts and, and places that our current system for writing down music doesn't give us the tools to um, be expressive in, but the computer does. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my little spiel on like, like modern arranging, sequencing, um, how composing is production, I think, um, and how you, I think you can do a lot with a little bit these days and music isn't less interesting because it's just the loop. That's where our creativity comes from. So does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. I see a hand up. Um, what things do you usually like produce for? Like what projects do you like make you think like, oh, I want to like produce that or something? Mm -hmm. um, well, so it's been a lot of paying my dues. Um, I'm only recently in a part of my career where I'm getting to be a lot more selective with who I work with. Um, but. I think for me, it's it's people who are getting a little bit weird. Um, when there's secret pop songs that are still in there at the core, it's like a great song, but but it's dressed up in cool clothes. I think I'm really, um, although I make pop music, I really like to get weird with it. And 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 I I grew up with like metal bands and Latin music, so anything that's um, powerful, aggressive, and rhythmic kind of always catches my ear. Um, so that's kind of how I'm choosing who to work with. But I think the uh, part two to that is how important it is to, again, refine our taste. Um, listen to so much music, like really be ruthless about what you like and what you don't like. And there's a whole uh, genealogy of like taste there that you'll find people who share a branch with you. Um, the more you know yourself. Please ask more questions, <laughs> please. Um, and I can talk about, I do, so I work with artists um, a lot, but um, I do songs for TV and film too. Um, I had a song in Birds of Prey that I actually wrote with my friend Sin, um, which was like the Harley Quinn movie. So I have some experience around that kind of stuff I've done like theme songs for TV shows. Um, I do singing too. I've sang, sang some theme songs. Um, and I've gone on, I have experience touring and stuff like that. So any any questions you guys have about those different realms? Uh-huh. I have a question. Um, if you like, if you write a song, and I know you can kind of tell like by like the lyrics or like the way it progresses, but how do you know what genre to produce it in? Mm. Okay. Um, I love lyrical producing. Um, I think nowadays we, I sing, I'm seeing a lot of artists that kind of uh, have multiple genres. Um, and I think with like the advent of the internet and being able to like source older music, we can kind of do whatever we want. So um, a lot of it comes down to what are the words saying? And honestly, like who's, what is the artist look like like what clothes are they wearing like what is the cultural baggage of the idea pools that their melodies are are from you know like if it's if it's from lap music they're gonna use different scales versus like hip-hop and 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 i think thinking about the baggage of like like culturally of of any idea or even a snare sound like you know a 70s snare sounds different than an 80s metal snare and they imply different things in our mind so um, I like to use like, like trying to make the artist come out of the speakers. 
Um, and, and that means taking in all of the cultural baggage of any information that I have, the way they speak, the way they dress, what they consume, um, what artists they listen to, and, and the words, and then kind of make like a, a, yeah, an amalgamation of like what that represents to me, but also what I know historically, and, um, and then try to, make, try to make that come out the speakers. Um, I think the, the musical genealogy is actually a really interesting part for that. Um, that really helps me fuse genres, because if you go far back enough, you find roots of genres. And so um, I can find that this rhythmic structure works with these contemporary trap sounds because they have a root. Um, so yeah, kind of just taking in as much information and, 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 and what does it remind you of? What do the words say that, what do they make you feel? And then kind of going from there. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, it was great. <laughs> cool. Um, <clears throat> um, it's yes. Uh -huh. oh, oh, there are more. Oh, go ahead. More yeah, questions. Go that's ahead. another question. Oh, um, just real quick. I don't know if you already um, mentioned this, but the song that we listened to, how long did it take you to put it together? Um, that one. So the original song. It was just a day because it was just electric guitar and vocals. Um, we were gunning for that song for like three years before it came out. <laughs> so it was a lot of just like getting the label to get on our side. That actually takes more time. Um, but this arrangement took probably a couple days, maybe three days. I have to work really quick from, for my job because I'm in sessions all the time with different people. So I kind of have to get a recording done in a day usually, um, which and it used to take me like a week. Before that, it took me like a month. So it's just reps and reps and reps. And I think now I, I can finish a recording in a day. Sometimes three hours. I've done that before. But that's that's just a lot of reps. Mm -hmm. um, like when you finish like producing a song, how long would you say it takes to get that song like released? or whatever, mm. or like set a release date? Um, so it depends. I mean, uh, if it's an independent artist, oh, it's always way quicker because there's not like all these approvals that you have to go through. And, and sometimes I'll finish a song and they're like, cool, I want to put it out, like get it ready to put out in like a month. And then that's the best. Um, but like this song I, I was telling you about, um, this is probably Sam's biggest song. Um, I think it's got like, like 20 million plays on Spotify at this point. Um, and we had to convince the label for literally three years that this was a good choice. Um, we already had the song written, it was already done. And um, sometimes people wanna take artists in other directions or have specific, specific goals for how to market things. So sometimes it's convincing people. Um, so yeah, a month to three years is the time range. I think I did the, the Trolls theme song um, that's on Netflix. Um, and that took, we wrote it, we wrote a 30 second version. Then a year later, we wrote a, a minute version. And then like a year and a half later, it came out. So sometimes it's that long. So you, oh, Becca, go ahead. I love it. No, in her. When you're picking your projects to help people produce, do you pick something that you know you'll enjoy and have some draw to or do you be like oh i can do this one i kind of need the money right now <laughs> so there's actually something that someone taught me in music school that i think is really applicable to this and it was about like taking a tour which is like he was like you either do a tour for three reasons you do it for the money you do it for the music or you do it for the hang and you can have if you have two of those you're set if you only have one of those it's gonna be like pulling teeth so I kind of try to just have at least good money, good music, or good music, a great hang, or a great hang, and great money, but not good music. You know, um, that's kind of a helpful way to, I, I found to, to pick things. Um, can you talk about your headspace for, you know, writing a song like with an artist 
um, versus writing a song for a theme song or writing a song mm -hmm. for a musical and having to wear those different hats. Like, how do you, how do you get into those different modes? Um, how, what, what things overlap between all of those? Like, are, is there some similarities between all of them? And then also, uh, what makes them different? Okay. Um, I think it would be the way, the role that function, that musical function takes. Um, I think sometimes when I'm creating something quickly for like a TV show or commercial or something like that, um, I'm really just trying to get it to energetically function in like a pleasing genre aware way, um, aware of like contemporary conventions or whatever I'm taking from. Um, and that's, that's really just driven by um, the energetic needs of the client. Um, it's not always about getting into like a really um, uh, maybe vulnerable headspace. Um, I think when I'm working with artists, it's way more function takes, takes a back seat. And it's really just, um, I think it's providing a safe space for people um, where, and, and somewhere that they can feel secure. Um, cause I think you need that to be, um, vulnerable and say hard things, hard things to say, or be curious or, um, any of those things. So that's almost like, a, a best friend therapy role sometimes. And then it's really listening to artists because, um, sometimes I might have more technical music, musical knowledge than them. And I'll be like, well, well, let's play it this way. And they'll be like, no, 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 I don't want it. I want it to only go three times. And, and in the past, I've been like, well, that's not right. That's not music. But when I listen to people, even people who really don't have that much musical knowledge and really listen and believe them, uh, I end up with these musical ideas that I would have never thought of because I went to music school, like cutting something in half that shouldn't be in half, creating more space or playing a chord and just sitting on it for what I deem as an unnecessary amount of time. Um, so yeah, just emotional safety to try out anything. Um, and then the function comes in finishing it rather than starting from a functional place. I think uh, that's probably the biggest difference for me. Very cool. Um, any other questions? I, ha I have some written down here. I can just keep going. Or, do you, or if you want to play some little, more music too. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Sure. Um, here, let me see. Uh, okay, I'll I'll play play one. Button up, I guess. While you're opening one. this up, mm -hmm. um, what uh, I've been kind of showing people how to do stuff on Dawes, mm -hmm. like, and people have. Uh, Cakewalk is one, um, uh -huh. uh, Garage Band, Logic, um, uh, Fruity Loops, FL Studio. Fruity Loops is really cool. A lot of like hit songs have been made in Fruity Loops and it's like, <laughs> um, is it just reps to get better at this? Cause like watching you on this, I'm still like, I don't know how he does like 90% of the stuff he's doing here. It is, it's like working out. It's, it really is just doing it and doing it and doing it. And I'm really lucky because I started when I was like 13 or 14 recording, um, 30 now. Um, so I have a lot of experience. Um, but and then you start to learn like how they're kind of all the same. I had a session where my computer didn't work and the writer had reason. And oh. I, I hadn't used reason before, but you kind of look at it and you're like, oh, these knobs kind of do the same thing. Um, but re learning shortcuts it's really, really, really helpful. Um, it's really boring, but it's very, very, very helpful. Did I do this one in Pro Tools? No, I didn't. There we go. Okay. Yes. Open this one. Don't save. Um, this one's a little more upbeat. Uh huh. Um, do you ever write things in like a notation system, like Finale, or just everything's in like a DAW? I think that people can read MIDI. Um, I've seen some producers who can tell what, literally hear the harmonic structure because they are so good at reading MIDI. 
Um, and that's why I like Ableton. Another reason I like Ableton is because it's so visual. Um, it's music is sound math, and Ableton's way better at math than me. So I can see the blocks. I can see how parts are 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 entering and stuff. I think I think uh, I can see the music on the computer sometimes. I, I had to write out one chart for a cello player one time. But um, in the pop field, um, you don't always get people who know who can read or so it's more by ear. Um, I have a, a friend who's a film composer and he's always printing stuff for an orchestra. So different worlds. Um, I would call him if I had to orchestrate something. I wouldn't do it myself. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm gonna show you guys this song just to show you another one. Um, this one's from the same project. I'm playing these because they're already out, um, but I have a bunch of cool stuff that is in this. Um, okay, just, just here's, yeah, same link. I'll just play this one from the top. If you have any questions, um, let me know. And I'll, I'll show you maybe a little piece of one more after this. This one's got more acoustic instruments. So that's just another one. Again, not a lot of tracks. It's just the, uh, this one's got like 28, but they're never really like playing at the same time. I think that that's another thing I would say for both composing and producing. Um, think about it this way. If you want something to sound big and epic, that's the guy on the mountaintop, like going like that, right? If you put him in a room and then you fill the room with a bunch of stuff, it's not gonna feel very epic. There's not space, negative space around things. So um, if, if, if you need something to sound bigger, delete. I think that's like a really, really good rule. Um, okay, I'll show you guys one more. Um, this one is, let's see. Okay. I encourage you all to go listen to, cause these are acoustic or stripped remixes yeah. of, mm -hmm. of the original recordings. So, mm -hmm. which also sound amazing. So go ahead and check those out if you want. I'm going to just drag the MP3 in because um, 
I have the session in Pro Tools and it'll take a sec to open it up. But this is just to show you guys. Um, so that's kind of what I do for like this one artist, Sin. Um, but I'll show you one of my songs. Um, this is my own project, just to show you like the differences in, in stuff that I do. Is this unreleased? <laughs> oh boy, sneak peek. <laughs> um, okay. This is unreleased, but it's coming out in about a month. So I can open up the session if anyone wants to hear it. But just uh, again, very little tracks. I think it sounds bigger that way. So this one is, it's Chaboy singing. Okay, here we go. So that one's got like a modulation <laughs> in it. And um, there's some genre bending. Like, I really like, um, I grew up in playing in like emo bands and stuff, but um, there's a, a the genre hyper pop that I really, really love. So I'm trying to take that, but make it even more pop. Um, and there's some like trap elements in that. Um, so it's a big, like, that's what I love doing. It's just like, like cooking. It's like cooking. Um, great metaphor for music always. So, yeah, that's that the kind of different worlds I, I, I exist in. That's song rules. Thanks. Um, we have a few more minutes if anyone has more questions. Yeah, I see a question. I see a few questions. Um, oh, there's an echo. <laughs> uh, do you mix your own music? And if not, um, who does? Um, what would be the process to find someone to do that for you? Sure. If you get that? Um, I used to I used to do mixing a lot, so um, sometimes I'll I'll mix things, but I honestly don't like mixing my own music. I think um, there's a point for me where I, I get things to sound like I want them to sound, and then I kind of lose a little bit of objectivity. Um, so it's just working with friends whose whose mixing I really trust and like. 
Um, uh, I don't always kind of go outside of my circle too much, um, just because I know my friends' tastes and I know whose tastes do what. And so I kind of call them as needed. And I think it's really important to work with your friends. I don't know how to um, come up uh, without friends. I think community is so, so, so important to music. Um, and we have to support each other. So I'm always trying to work with just peers. I think um, that's kind of how I find mixing, just peers. It's not always like the big dog, you know. <laughs> yeah. Sky, you have a question? Um, since you said that you have like a lot of like sessions or like how like um what's like a day look like for you when you have to like go into work? Mm -hmm. Um, so uh typical session time in LA is about noon or one. Um in Nashville they start at like ten for a while. Um, uh, but, uh, it's usually, you know, do like administrative work in the mornings, um, maybe get other sessions, um, errands and that kind of thing. Um, and then just kind of mentally prep myself to meet someone. It's usually new people. Um, uh, I'm, I have a publishing deal and managers, so they're kind of finding me different people to work with. Um, so, you know, just, uh, get ready to to meet new energy or, or or sometimes it's collab with someone that I really like um, but then those are pretty long days like it's kind of exhausting to write a song every day you wouldn't think it's so tiring but using your brain is really really exhausting um, so yeah and then I think another thing to note is that in the pop world that I'm in um, you actually only get paid when a song comes out so I work for free on spec every day um it's kind of a, a lottery a little bit um so it means i have to be really fast i have to be really good um and it's it's a little bit scary but i think just jumping into it kind of like you get your sea legs so to speak um but yeah i mean i write it's a lot uh, i do like 200 songs a year usually um and those are like all with recording so that's your reps um but usually just the yeah, a little bit of admin work, chill, then session. Um, and then I'm Where really do you work? Where do you uh, this work? Is, this is my garage. I work here at my house. Um, so I have a, let's see, I have a, a drum set behind me over there. Maybe you can see it. I have a bunch of guitars. I have this vocal booth. I have a piano right there. Um, so this is my little musical um, garage. Um, uh, okay, we're, we're at the end of time, but I have one more question. Sure. I would say, uh, you're, I would say you are someone that <clears throat> I personally aspire to attain a lot of the things that you've been able to do and to be, have a level of mastery that you have, um, in a lot of what you do and work ethic. Is there like a, you know, if, if I'm at, if I'm a young songwriter or composer and I'm 10 years younger than you, what, like, what should we be doing in order to get to where you are? What, 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 what brought you to where you are? Do you think? We write a song I, a day? I think that think? it is what brought me to where I am is a uh, community, make a lot of friends, um, good friends that you actually like to work with. Um, a bit of obsession, um, but you guys are all here, so <laughs> I'm sure you have that part down. And I think the one that I would say that is prescriptive for me looking back is rest. Um, I think I made a lot of bad music for a long time because I wasn't resting enough and I wasn't taking in um, things. And we're not art machines. We don't just input life and output art. We make art as a reaction to living and so giving yourself time to have experiences and live life um, is every time I do that, my music is better. And I wish I would have done that sooner. I think that's a beautiful place to stop. Thank you, Matthias. Of course. Um, thank you for having me. Round of applause for my friend. Uh, 
Randall, you want to? Yes. Yeah, thank you, dude. What do we do now, Randall? Are you taking people to food? Unshare the uh, the screen. Okay. Here we go. There we go. We can see everybody now. Okay. <laughs> you, you might not have seen the round of applause that you got, Matthias. Uh, I, I actually, I have these little windows set up, and it was really beautiful. It was like a little <laughs> sea of applause. I can Thanks see very the much, applause. Matthias. <laughs> of course. Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you. If everybody could just stay where they are for just a second. A lot of people are in the room. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven of you are here. We have 19, eight of you that are online. Um, and I would like everyone to come to uh, who can, who's in River Falls, come to room 113. Um, what we're doing is reviewing and coming up with a plan uh, for the schedule for the rest of the day. So if you could come here. Uh, Mary Kate wanted me to remind people of some things and I've forgotten what they were, but I remembered to remind her to tell people stuff and I've forgotten what it is. She's getting it on her phone right now. So hold on. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Matthias. Okay, so, oh, 